Mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the Gospel reading read a few moments ago, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. This is our text. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's getting toward fall, and for some reason that always makes me a little bit reminiscent, and I think back over things, and this reading really is probably very appropriate, because I was just thinking about my parents over the last couple of weeks, and about, you know, the the steps that we've been through as they've aged, and I was thinking a lot about moving them out of their house and selling all of their goods, and it reminded me of some of those things that didn't sell or that we threw away because they wouldn't sell. And one of those things, maybe some of you ladies can uh, identify with this, is some candles. You know, those little decorative ones that you get for each holiday. When mom would decorate the house for Christmas, there'd be little snowman candles and there'd be, you know, little Santa candles or whatever. And she did that for all of the holidays. And they always sat in the same place, the left buffet door, top shelf. And I always wondered why we never used them. And then we got to the day when it was time for them to sell their house, and all of those things got thrown away. And I thought, well, they were fun while they lasted, but did they really fulfill their purpose? Mm, No, not really. It's like, Mom, what were you waiting for? Well, just the right time. Gift cards can be the same way. You know, everybody wants to save those for just the right thing. I'm waiting for just the right thing so that I can go to the store and buy that. I know that tool is there. When it's on sale, I'll take this card and I'll get it. What are you waiting for? Just go get it. It's more than just seize the day. It's don't waste the day. We have a little bit of that going on in our readings today. In Amos, there were those who thought that the coming of the day of the Lord would keep them not only fat and sassy as they already were, oppressing the poor and doing injustice, but that it would just get even better for them. And the prophet reminds them, no, the coming of the day of the Lord is a day that you should be afraid of because you are not honoring the Lord. You are instead gathering things for yourselves. In 1 Thessalonians, the apostle has to remind the Thessalonians, that the Lord is faithful to his promise. And no, they didn't miss his coming again. Written in about 51 AD, 20 some years after Jesus' life, they thought that maybe he'd already come and they'd missed it. Written just about a year earlier, Matthew does the same thing. And you know, Matthew speaks of the end times and of the judgment of the world more often than any of the other evangelists. He really makes a point of telling us that we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. Now, there is a certain sense of warning that goes along with that. But it's also a word of encouragement. Twenty years later, after Jesus had died and ascended into heaven... The excitement was kind of waning a little bit. There were all kinds of other distractions in life. He had to remind them, yes, the Lord is coming back and you do not know the day or the time. We need that same sort of warning, don't we? Sometimes we get a little bit lackadaisical. Maybe we're, maybe we're way too comfortable in the status quo. Waiting can be difficult, to be sure. Sometimes, though, we wait with an eagerness, and other times we wait with a bit of anxiety. Our Lord, through the words of Matthew, would have us wait with eagerness, an awareness of his coming again, an awareness each day that this might be the day when our Lord gathers us out of all of the struggles of this world, fulfills his promise to us, and takes us to be with the Lord forever. He wants us to be very aware So that we live our lives with that same sort of urgency and expectation. What are you waiting for? So often I hear people say, well, you know, I really should get back to church. I know I should. It's just there's so many things. What are you waiting for? You know, I know I I should join a Bible study. What are you waiting for? 
We can find all kinds of excuses, can't we? And 2,000 years later, yes, I think the joy and the expectation has waned a little bit. He hasn't come in all of this time. Who says he's going to come in my lifetime? The apostles dealt with that in their day, and still it plagues the church. We tend to get caught up in the things that are around us, and we lose out on the most important thing that we're waiting for. Jesus and his coming again. We may wait for paychecks. We may wait for babies. We may wait for gifts and Christmas and all kinds of things. We may be waiting to burn those special candles. But really, what are you waiting for? Why are you wasting time? The Lord reminds us that it is important for us to be prepared for his coming again. And he gives us every reason to be excited about it as he speaks to us through his holy word. He is indeed faithful to his promise. All of his promises. He will be faithful to this one at all as well. He reminds us that we know neither the day nor the hour. And all of us know that things in life can change in a snap, can't they? Perhaps it's a financial difficulty. All of a sudden, we plummet and there's nothing left. Perhaps it's a storm that blows through and destroys almost all of our belongings. Perhaps it's the sudden death of someone that we love. We never know, do we? And yet, all of those signs don't seem to be enough to encourage us to buckle down and be prepared. Our Lord does not make it difficult. He comes to us in his holy word, reminding us over and over of his great love for us and the expectation and hope that is ours. And if that's not enough, he comes to us particularly in the Lord's Supper. One of the major reasons that we gather together as the church, that we might taste that hope and that we might have the strength of Christ himself to continue our journey with hope and expectation. He reminds us that we are not left to our own. And he reminds us that we are never separated by more than simply sight as God's people. But we are one. One body of Christ. One in him. One in his forgiveness. One in his love. One in his hope. And the joy that fills us. So what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Reach out that hand to that person that you know you should check on. Reach out that hand to serve the one you know you should be serving because they're in need and you might be able to help. Reach out to that one who is sitting in the pews not far from you, who either needs a word of encouragement or who is perhaps new to the community. What are you waiting for? There will be no better time than now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please stand as we confess our baptismal faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 